Praise the Lord. We're going to turn in our Bibles to 1 John. First John chapter number one. First John chapter number one. We're going to begin reading at verse number one. First John chapter number one. We're going to begin reading at verse, excuse me, number nine. First John chapter number one. We're going to begin reading at verse number nine. And last, we're continuing this sermon the series on breaking free. We're going to continue the sermon on series on breaking free. Last week, if you remember, we talked about that God leaves the light on. That was the title, that God leaves the light on. So we're going to 1 John today, chapter number 2, verse number, I'm sorry, chapter number 1. That's my second verse, sorry. 1 John chapter number 1, verse 9. Amen. 1 John chapter number 1, verse 9, and we're going to read it into chapter number 2. That's why I was getting confused. Amen. Are we all there? Amen. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in verse 10 it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. Now let's turn over to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, these things... Write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, he will have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Thank God for the reading of his word today. Amen. So last week we talked about that God leaves the light on for us. And we discussed about the prodigal son and how he went and he took the inheritance of his father and he asked for it and he went out and he blew his money. But yet the father came and when the son came back home, the father was there with open arms ready to kill the fatted calf, ready to put a ring on his finger and accept him back into his kingdom, right? So we learned about that on last week, and I closed it that, that God is able to forgive us for the sins that we do. That God is able and He accepts us back into His fold. And I left you with three things, and I want to review those three things. I said no matter how far away you have gone, you can come back. No matter how far out you have gone, you can come in. And no matter how far down you have done, you can come up. Amen. That's what we left with on last week. So this week we're talking about, we're going to continue the series on breaking free. And we're talking about an invitation to intimacy. An invitation to intimacy. The way we see God, your revelation of Him will not affect your relationship with God. And the acceptance of God to you. Let me say that again. The way you see God, your revelation of God, will not affect the acceptance of what God thinks of you. However, it affects on what you think God wants you to do. Hello, somebody. It doesn't affect the fact that of God's acceptance to you, but it does affect how you see God and how you react to what God tells you. Hello, somebody. Now, let me explain myself. What I'm saying is, is that many people have a distorted thought pattern and have accepted something distorted that God is something that He is absolutely not. 
We talked about last week that a lot of people think that God is someone who is ready to smite everybody that sins. That is not who God is. Hello, somebody. God is not wanting to twist and, and maim you and make you sick and kill you and destroy you. That is the enemy's job. Come on, somebody. The enemy is here to what? kill, steal, and destroy. God simply wants you to have an intimate relationship with Him. He wants you to simply have an intimate relationship with Him. But people have a very negative thought and relationship with God because they believe that this guilt has been put on them and they have hopelessness. And they're in despair. Why? Because people have twisted and distorted the thought of God and who God really is. My, my, my. A few years ago, there was a national survey. There was a research project that launched. And the purpose of the project was to know how Americans think of God. Well, let me tell you how they think of God. 31% of all Americans... 31% of all Americans saw God as an authoritarian. As an authoritarian. When asked to describe what they meant by that, they said rules, rules, and more rules. That God is all about rules. So 31% of Americans thought that God was nothing but an authoritarian and He was all about rules. Anybody ever felt that way before? If we were honest, we've probably all been there at one point in time in our life, right? Especially when we're first learning about God. And then a lot of organizations will push the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? So they think rules, rules, rules. So 31% of Americans still to this day think that God is just authoritarian. He's all about rules. Let me tell you what the rest of them think. 16% said that they picture God that he was a critical God. And that you can ever, ever please him. 16% of Americans said that they picture God as a critical God and you can never, ever please him. My Lord, that's a lot of people. The next was 24% said that their picture of God was that of a distant God. That he was very hands off. Who leaves us basically to do on our own without his help. So 24% believe that God is just up in the sky somewhere. And he's just sitting there. And he's just chilling. Y'all know what chilling is, right? He's sitting in the lazy boy with his feet up watching TV. Which is the earth. And his hands off. Y'all go ahead and live your life. I'm just going to look around. I don't care what you do. But I'm just going to sit here. 24% of Americans think that of God. That he's simply there just sitting up in heaven in his lazy boy watching TV. All right? Wow. Now think about it. That 71% of Americans that already have a distorted view. We're the richest nation of the world. The land of opportunity. The land of great things. And yet they still have a negative aspect of God. Hmm. Wow. By the way though, another 23% of Americans see God as being a benevolent God. When asked to describe what they meant, they responded that God is my buddy and hell is a myth. Now we're in bad shape. What is that? 94% that have a distorted view of God. That's why I'm teaching this series on breaking free. It's not breaking free of a whole bunch of sins. It's breaking free of the information that we've been fed that has distorted the view of God and who He really is. And a lot of people are leaving the church and by the thousands, by the millions even, because they have a distorted view of who God is. They see God as an authoritarian, that He's just there to just 
put rules and rules and rules. And then those other folks think God is our buddy and that helps and men, so why even serve God? He doesn't care what we do. And then you have those that just think that, that God just wants to do whatever and He's just sitting back and saying, the heck with y'all, right? I'm in my lazy boy. I'm having a good time. I don't care what you do. I created you. I don't want to do anything else. Wow. And then you have those that just believe that God's your buddy and that He's going to be all right and hell doesn't exist and it doesn't matter what we do. Hmm. So 94% of Americans have a distorted view of who God is. 94% of Americans have a distorted view of who God really is. That means only 6% really understand what a relationship with the Father truly is. If you don't believe me, I dare you to go to churches today, to different churches, and ask them who God is. And you'll get many, many, many different answers. Many, many different answers. And you'll get some of these same answers that I gave you today. Why? Because of the distortedness that has been taught and that it's been, it's, it's kind of like it's one-sided. Each organization and each church teaches things one-sided a lot of times. They don't really look at Scripture and teach what God really and who He truly is and how He truly taught us to be. Christ came so that we might know who? God. Hello, somebody. Christ came so that we might know God. Christ came so that we could, He died and so that He rose again so that we can be forgiven for our sins through propitiation. That's what it's talking about. That He took on sin for us so we no longer have to live in sin. Now why would God give up His only Son, come to the earth, die on the cross, go through pain and suffering, and He doesn't care about anybody? <laughs> Think about that. Why would He have done it? He would not have done it. So God is not a hands-off God. God is not a God of rules. He's a God of relationship. Here's the thing. If you look at God as a God of rules, you look at God as someone ruling over you. It's kind of like a dictatorship. And if you look at God that way, then you'll always be looking for the next punishment to come. Hello, somebody. And you'll be in fear of salvation. If you see God in an authoritarian way, you'll be in fear of your salvation every single day of your life and you'll be afraid that you're going to hell every single day of your life. Do you think that God wanted us to live that way? There's no wonder folks don't want to be a Christian if they think that way. And I'm going to live in fear every day. Well, they can live in fear in the world. They can live in fear and anxiety in the world and believe what the world says in that when, when death is done, it's done, right? It's over. There's nothing after that. But we as believers need to understand that God is not a God of authoritarian. He's not a God of rules. He's a God of relationships. And when we create relationship with the Father and we begin to understand and believe the Father and understand Him and talk with Him, commune with Him, walk with Him, talk with Him, Listen to His Word. Read His Word. Get it in our spirit. Then it will no longer become rules to us. It will be a relationship status. Hello, somebody. That we can put on Facebook if we want. In love with God. And what happens is that those rules no longer are rules anymore. They become a relationship thing. And they automatically happen in our life. Right. Hello, somebody. The problem is, is when we shove people down with the Ten Commandments and all of these things, we shove it down the throat, we create a relationship of fear. Hello, somebody. We create a relationship of fear. When I go up and I preach fire and brimstone and everybody's going to hell in a hand basket, they're not getting saved because of a relationship. They're getting saved out of fear of dying and burning in hell. Hello, somebody. They'll say, well, well, the Holy Spirit convicted them. Was it the Holy Spirit or was it your tone and was it the way you presented fire and brimstone preaching? And if you look, you'll see that many of those, only a small percent of those folks, stay and are discipled in a church and learn more about God. 
Why? Because they accepted Christ through fear. Not through reason and not through relationship. Can I tell the truth this morning? We don't need folks to get saved because of fear. We need folks to accept Christ because they want to build a relationship with their Creator. Yes. They need to understand that God is a God who loves them and who wants the best for them and who wants to transform their lives to be a better themselves here on this earth so that when they die, they'll have a better self on the other side. Hello, somebody. So God is not an authoritarian. He's not a God of this authoritarian. Also, another distorted view is that we talked about that God is a critical God. So we talked about this a little bit last week. Some people think that God is sitting, waiting for us to make a mistake. And we talked about it and we said that God is going to say, Aha! I got you! Right? Like some of our bosses have done in the past that bought at our jobs or wherever it may be, you know, they're just waiting for you to mess up so they can say, ah, I got you. I'm going to write you up. Anybody ever had a boss that way before? <laughs> Amen. Say, I'm going to write you up. I was waiting for you to mess up. Well, how many of those, if you're waiting for somebody to mess up, they're going to eventually mess up. It's a distorted view. So people are thinking that God is sitting there with his clipboard. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sitting there with a clipboard, waiting with his pen to check your name off. He's got the book of life. This is what some people think. Some people think that God is sitting there up in heaven and he's got the book of life. Right? He's got the book of life up in heaven. He's like this. Like an adventure match of God like this. You know. He's holy, right? He's been around a long time, right? He's like this, you know. And he's this way. He's this way. Ah! Jack just made a mistake. I'm going to mark his name out of the book of life. Some people think that. Marsha, oh, she just messed up. I'm going to mark her name out. Norman just missed it. I'm going to mark his name out. And they feel that God is that critical. And that if they don't do everything just right, that God will not accept them. Well, nobody's perfect. Hello, somebody. Amen. Nobody is perfect. Nobody can live life according to every single rule or law in the Bible. If you look at the Old Testament or the First Testament, there were over 613 laws that in Judaism they had to live by. 613 laws that in Judaism they had to live by. Do you think anyone lived up to 613 laws? No way. They tried. But they couldn't. So God said what? He said there's a law above every law. And that's to love me as you love yourself. Love me as you love yourself. And he also talks about loving others. So people have this distorted view that God is a critical God and there with his book ready to mark your name out because of the church. Hello, somebody. How did the view get started? The church. The church started the critical view of God. They said that God is there to judge every single day. That God is judging people, the just and the unjust. And yes, it does say that one day there will be a judgment. But God is not sitting there waiting for somebody to mess up so He can say, Aha! I got that one. Satan, you got another one for your team. That's what people think. They won't say that, but they're actually thinking that. But the Lord says that He is the judge. That He is the judge. Hello, somebody. 
We are not the judge. If we were the judge, a lot of people would be in hell. And probably you would be too because somebody's judging you and they don't like how you do things. So we'd all be there probably if we were judging one another. We'd say, oh, I don't like the way she wears those shoes. Oh, did you see what? She didn't even match last Sunday. She ought to go to hell. That's the way some people are so petty. Oh, did you see how she looked at me? She looked at me crazy. She didn't even say, hey, how dare she? Who she thinks she is? Lord, you need to send her to hell. Some people are that petty. So if we were judging one another, we would all be there. But thankfully, God is judging us, and He is righteous and just in everything that He does. So He's not looking at just a snippet of your life. He's taking your whole life and saying, did you strive to live for me? What are you doing the absolutely best you could do? What are you thinking and reading on me and, and praying and talking to me and communing with me? That's how God is. He's not just going to say, oh, you know, you messed up right here. You know? You know, you shouldn't have hung out with those folks and did those things during that year. You know, you were I saw you were at Woodstock in the 70s. I'm going to blot you out. Come on. See, I got some of y'all already. Oh, you went to that, you went to that house party in the 90s. You got <clears throat> no, you're out. Out! Not another chance. People really think that that's how God is. God is not that way. Then the other people think that God is a distant God. He's in his recliner. I like recliners, by the way. They're wonderful. And I have one in my bedroom now, so it's really wonderful. And so God is just sitting back, and he's just in his recliner, and he's laying back, and he's just, you know, he's just sitting back and saying, whoop, y'all do whatever y'all want to do. I'm good. I'm God, right? I'm God. Y'all go ahead and keep it down on the earth. You know, keep it cool. Whatever y'all want to do, y'all just do. You live your life however you want, because I didn't really want to have a relationship with you anyway. I just created you just to put you on earth so that you can live your life and die. Some people think that. So God is up the pie in the sky, and He says to wonderful God. Everybody's roses, everybody's flowers, that all smell good, everybody, nobody's dirty, nobody does any wrong. Everybody's wonderful. Everybody's great. And everybody's going to heaven. I love all of you. Now do your thing. But they say, do your thing, girl. Work it. Right? So they say on the stage, do your thing. That's not how God is either. That's a distorted view. God wants us to have a relationship with Him and He wants to see Him for who He really is. There's no wonder that people don't want to know a God that is like those things, that He's authoritarian and He's distant and He's always critical of folks. No wonder the people don't want to know Him. I don't want to know a God like that. How you see God really does matter. It is a lot like living with an alcoholic parent. One minute, they're kind as they can be. And in just in a moment, they're a mean, devil, snake you've ever seen. Because they got that bottle and that's just it. The toast. If anybody's ever experienced that, then you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like living with a person that might be bipolar. One minute they're nice, don't take that meds, and they'll be mean about five seconds later. It flip of a switch. Those folks need treatment. There's help for that. Amen? Not talking negative over, but I'm just using that as a light as to say, one minute they're nice, and one minute they're mean. Some people think that God is like that. Well, God was mean in the Old Testament, now he's nice in the New Testament. He must be bipolar. 
It's kind of like Texas weather. One day it's hot, the next day it's hotter. One day it's during the winter, one day it's 80 degrees, and the next day it's 40 degrees and raining. Right? Or this past year, or this year, one day it was 75 and the next day it was snowing. Man, doesn't know what it wants to do. So your thoughts of how God really is does matter. So many people, especially those who have come from a home life where their parents were anything but consistent, they carry those struggles and twisted perceptions over time and over into their relationships. When they've had a bad home life, they carry those, re those twisted ideals and twisted thoughts of a relationship into every relationship they're in, including the relationship they have with God. Hello, somebody. That's why it's important to allow God to heal you and your inner self and for God to heal you and let you understand who you really are in Him. Because if not, you will continue to hurt others. You'll continue to do exactly what you've always been taught and you've always done. And it will carry it over into the relationship with God. And you'll think distorted things of God because of your hurtful past. Would you ask help from a greedy God? Would you praise a malicious God? Would you seek love from an unpleasurable God? Would you place your confidence in an untruthful God? Can I ask you though, when you have blown it big time and you look up to God's face, what does God look like? When you've blown it big time and you look up at God and you see His face, what does God look like? Is he that mean, red-faced devil? No. Mad at you? How dare you? Y'all ever had children like, I can't believe you did that. Right? Y'all ain't never said that, right? Or do you see God as accepting, ready to love you and teach you and have a teachable moment in your life to show you where you could have improved? What do you think God does after you fail. Is there some area that you feel you're never good enough to sue God? Ask yourself, is there an area in your life that you're never good enough to sue God? Do you ever feel like you frustrate God? When you do something that God doesn't like, how do you think that He's going to punish you? That's the question. So many people are in punishment and in bondage because the twisted and warped perceptions of God. God is seen through the lens of past experiences. When God is seen through the lens of past experiences, then we really truly lose sight of who God really is. You say, well, how can I change that from seeing God through past experiences? Well, it's you have to allow God to cleanse you and heal you from the hurt. God wants to be intimate with you, but some of us have problems being intimate because we feel like those that we've been intimate with in the past, we've shared things with them, and they took them and they used them against us. Y'all ain't never had that experience, right? Things we shared with folks that we thought we could trust. And then we find out later that they used them against us. So then our relationship with God is distorted because we think if we share things with God, then God will somehow come back and they'll haunt us later. Well, how many knows God already knows everything that you know? And God already knows everything you've ever been through. And whether you believe it or not, God was there when you went through those things. Yeah. 
So we have to have an undiluted relationship of intimacy. If God had intended for you and me to live in bondage, Jesus would never have said in Luke 4 when He said that God sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and set at liberty those who were captive. It is never the will of God for any of us to stay in bondage. It is never the will of God for any of us to remain a prisoner in waiting. We're not, but many people still live in a captive, not in a physical prison, but an emotional prison. They live in their emotions. They're captive to wrong ideals and wrong thoughts and patterns and captive to destructive lifestyles because of experience. And one of those prisons that many, many people live in is the fear or the feeling of never being quite sure that God has forgiven them or not. God will forgive everything in your life. One of the most frequently quoted scriptures in the Bible is 1 John 1 and 9, which we said, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. If we run back time and time again to the verse, hoping that God hears us, hoping that He's going to somehow change His mind, and hoping that, that we're going to come into this place, but never quite sure of it, we're in prison in our own minds. If we only hope that God is just and forgive, ready to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, then we're still in prison in our own mind. So how many of you are free as you want to be? How many of you are enjoying life as much as you want to enjoy life? That's the question this morning in closing. The only way to truly have an intimate relationship with God is to be an open book. If you look at it this way, God already knows every thought you've ever thought. God knows everything you've ever done, good or bad. So why not just talk to Him? Spend that time with Him. God is yearning for it intimate relationship with us. He is your creator. But He wants to be your God. Come on somebody. He is your creator. But He wants to be your God. And the only way that He can be your God is you to submit your whole life to Him. And to get rid of misconceptions and these ideals that are false. That God doesn't love you. That God is there to be critical of you. That God wants to beat you in the head every time you do something wrong. He wants to throw the Bible at you literally and hit you in the head and beat you with it. That is not God. God will judge those who are righteous on the day of judgment. But now He wants us to strive to live for Him. That is our job. Live for Him. Do the best we can possibly do. It's not in ourselves, but it's in Christ. He took sin so that we could have life freely and more abundantly, so that we don't live in fear, but we live in fullness, knowing that God gives us the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit so that we can walk in it and walk in it in love. In closing, I want to say, there's an old saying that says you attract 
more bees with honey. Right? Than you do with sour things or stinky things. Right? So why would God want to be a stinky thing when he could be honey and all of us are attracted to him? It's the same thing in the world. If you're going to testify about how good God is, do it with honey. Hello, somebody. Do it with sweetness. You can't go to somebody and say, you're going to hell. Even though it says in the Ten Commandments that you're going to hell. People say these things, I promise you. God doesn't like you. Wow, that's going to make me want to change, I promise you. Man, I want to know that, God, right? They're going to be lining up. I don't think so. They're running away. They're like, man, they're crazy. They're cuckoo. They're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. 